Bonjour, Wachanin. Welcome to Lakehead University's Global Indigenous Speaker Series, Revitalizing Indigenous Languages, with guest speaker, Dr. Brendan Kishkaton, Ojibwe Language Revitalization at the University of Minnesota. We are happy that you are able to join us today. Uh, Denise Baxter, Indigenous Cause, Martin Falls, and Donjaba. My name is Denise Baxter, Vice Provo Indigenous Initiatives at Lakehead University, and I will be your MC for the event today. Lakehead remains committed to social justice and social responsibility. Lakehead University will continue to advance the Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls for action and University's Canada principles on Indigenous education. Lakehead University respectfully acknowledges its campuses are located on the lands of Indigenous peoples. Lakehead Thunder Bay is located on the traditional lands of the Fort William First Nation, signatory to the Robinson Spear Treaty of 1850. Lakehead Aurelia is located on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg. The Anishinaabeg include the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi nations, collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy. Lakehead University acknowledges the history that many nations hold in the areas around our campuses and is committed to a relationship of respectful relationships with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples based on the principles of mutual trust, respect, reciprocity, and collaboration in the spirit of reconciliation. Before we begin, I would like to quickly run through some housekeeping items. Important notice of video recording of the Global Indigenous Speaker Series. Participants are reminded that this online event is being recorded, and we are doing this to preserve a record of the event in the university archives and to publicize and promote Lakehead University. By attending, you are agreeing to be included in the recording and its public dissemination in any media now known or later developed anywhere in the world in perpetuity. All participants are muted to ensure seamless continuity throughout the event today. And we will have a question and answer period at the conclusion of the lecture, which will be about uh, 1245 or 1250. So if you could please put any questions you might have in the chat and I will moderate uh, those at this time. It is now my pleasure to introduce Elder Jerry Martin from Metogamy First Nation, who will share an opening prayer. Welcome Elder Martin. You're muted Elder Martin. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, um, we can. <clears throat> okay. Bonjour, wache, shego, washte. Good morning. Isn't it a beautiful day? It's quiet, snow is falling. It's not a blizzard. And we're probably someplace warm and comfortable, which is something to be grateful for. Each morning that you wake up and you see yourself on this side of the ground, that's a good morning. So I'm going to start with uh, sharing a, a prayer from a Dakota author that I've used on and off over the years. And um, one day I'm going to have to translate this into Anishinaabe movement. But it's, uh, some of the concepts are different. Anyways. O oh, great spirit, whose voice I hear in the wind, and whose breath gives life to all the world, hear me. I am small and weak. I need your strength and wisdom. Make my hands respect the things you have made and others, and my ears sharp to hear your voice. Let me learn the lessons you have hidden in every leaf and rock. I seek strength not to be greater than my brother, but to fight my greatest enemy, myself. May I always be ready to come to you with clean hands and straight eyes. So when my life fades as a fading sunset, my spirit will come to you without shame. So anyway, miigwech, have a good day and uh, thanks for everybody for attending. Miigwech, Elder Martin, for your beautiful opening this morning and your very kind words. Um, I would like to now introduce Dr. David Barnett, who is the Provost and Vice President Academic at Lakehead University. Welcome. Thank you, Denise, and Chimigwich Elder Martin for your beautiful opening. I appreciate you opening for us today in such a good way. Uh, it is a pleasure to welcome you today to our first lecture in the Global Indigenous Speaker Series, Revitalizing Indigenous Languages. The United Nations General Assembly proclaimed the period between 2022 and 2032 as the International Decade of Indigenous Languages. 
The proclamation of an international decade is a key outcome of the 2019 International Year of Indigenous Languages, for which the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization leads the global effort. This year's speaker series aims to highlight and draw attention to the critical situation of many Indigenous languages. Languages play a crucial role in the daily lives of people, not only as a tool for communication, education, social integration, and development, but also as a repository for each person's unique identity, cultural history, traditions, and memory. But despite their immense value, languages around the world continue to disappear at an alarming rate. Today, we are honored to have Dr. Brendan Kishkathan join us. And Brendan is a member of both the Ojibwe and Kickapoo tribes. He earned a PhD in linguistics from the University of Minnesota in 2009, and currently works as an associate professor in the Department of American Indian Studies at the University of Minnesota. Brendan's primary interest is the documentation, preservation, and revitalization of the Ojibwe language. He teaches currently Ojibwe language classes at the University of Minnesota, and as the director of Ojibwe languages, he oversees the Bachelor of Arts in Ojibwe language program in the Ojibwe Immersion House. Please join me today in giving a warm welcome to Brendan. Welcome, Brendan. Hello, everybody. Um, uh, thank you for inviting me to come speak with you guys. Uh, pleasure to be here. And um, yeah, let's get started, huh? I guess we can get started. Um, now, can I can I make a small request? Can I make a small request? Um, 99% of you guys are hitting, hidden. And um, I'm not sure why. Um, are you? Uh, if I could request that you guys, if you're watching, uh, I'd like to see your face. Yes, thank you, thank you. Um, normally, when we go speak, when I go speak somewhere, or you go speak somewhere, I'm looking at an audience. Um, but when everybody has their their face hidden, it's like talking to a wall. I'm already talking to a computer. So yes, I'm, I'm speaking to live people. And yeah, thank you guys. Thank you, thank you. And um, so, cause I wanna see who I can tease, who I can't tease. Jessica is on, so she's gonna get a good teasing. Um, see who else is on here. Got some elders? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Over in uh, Wabagoon Lake. The elders and uh, I see you. All right. You guys are going to get a thorough teasing. Uh, let's see who else. All right. Nice. Now it feels like living human beings. Okay. There's a bunch of people that's not that's not on board. That's okay. It's all right. Cynthia Jordan. Cynthia. Okay. All right. I don't know what's up. I mean, she <laughs> just gave me a thumbs up. I guess she's busted today. Her face is busted, so she she's not showing. All right, it's okay, Cindy. It's all right. You get a pass. Uh, other other people, I don't I don't know you guys. All right, so there's a bunch of shanobs on here. Um, we have some uh, we have some uh, professors on here. It looks like we have some professionals. We have some uh, language learners. We have some elders. Um, guys, thank you for uh, showing me your face. I know some people are uncomfortable with that. I don't know, the Zoom. Um, I used to, in, in classes, guys, I used to allow. Hi, Cynthia. All right, all right, all right. She, she, uh, let's see, um, some people. Uh, Hector, he's not moving. He's just a mannequin, I guess. <laughs> all right, no jokes today. No jokes today, guys. Let's be serious. And let's be academic and let's be clinical. Um, all right, guys, I uh, just want to give you that option. All right, guys, um, just a little bit about myself. I wanted to talk a little bit about myself. Uh, you may not know me. Some of you may not know me. Some of you know me. And, um, and where I'm coming from, what we're doing here at the University of Minnesota. I'm a pro uh, associate professor here at the University of Minnesota. Um, I am both uh, Kickapoo on my mom's side and Ojibwe on my dad's side from Leech Lake here. In I live here in Minnesota now. I grew up in Oklahoma. So if you hear a slight southern drawl, um, that's why. Um, I grew up on my mom's side and the Kickapoo side. 
Um, I try to suppress my Southern accent, um, but I, I don't think I'm very successful. I always think I talk, talk like Minnesotans, but it's very clear that I don't. Okay, guys, so um, I'm going to tease you about your English dialects probably a little bit. And, um, uh, but my dad's from Ojibwe, uh, from, uh, is Ojibwe from Leech Lake. And I work in language revitalization and Ojibwe language revitalization. And um, my, I got a PhD, uh, my bachelor's in linguistics, my master's in linguistics, and my PhD is in linguistics. And uh, man, I even think I got a, a kindergarten certificate in linguistics too. I don't know. Um, my whole life is linguistics, guys, and um, academic linguistics, but I'm not in the linguistics department here at the University of Minnesota. I'm in the American Indian, uh, American Indian Studies department here, and I'm the director of Ojibwe language uh, here in our department, but I am also oversee the bachelor's degree in Ojibwe language. We have a bachelor's degree in Ojibwe language, guys. I don't know what's going on, guys, but you guys should be jumping up and down. All right, nobody's jumping up and down. All right, if we have a, you can get a bachelor's degree in Ojibwe language. We have four years of the of instruction. Four years. We also have an immersion house, an Ojibwe immersion house, where our students can live together and only speak Ojibwe. That's, um, yeah, that's that's kind of new, right? You, I don't know if you guys knew. Who knew about our Ojibwe language, Ojibwe immersion house? Nobody. Oh, some people did. We did, Yeah. We have an Ojibwe, and we've been doing it for about two or three years now. Two or three years now, students, been, and it's been going very, uh, really well. It's been going really good. Um, so, yeah, um, and I teach Ojibwe language courses. And as for myself, guys, as for myself, um, I, I'm an adult language learner of Ojibwe language. I didn't, I didn't have the pleasure of growing up speaking Ojibwe. Um, my dad doesn't speak a lick of Ojibwe, and uh, so I had to learn it. How I learned it was hanging out with elders. I didn't really take classes at, at a university or anything. I just learned it uh, hanging out with the elders here and using my linguistics background um, to, to aid in that, which is why I got into linguistics in the first place. Um, I also speak Japanese. I spent two, uh, I lived in Japan for two years. And um, became fluent in Japanese. I'm not so fluent anymore, but I can still speak. Um, and I can still speak to Japanese people, have conversations. Um, but my experience living in living in uh, in Japan and learning Japanese also helped me to uh, a lot of learn a lot of strategies for language learners. Um, yeah, so um, so I kind of bring that to the table also. I guess if that's something to bring to the table, but um, so anyway, so we uh, here at the University of Minnesota, we're really dedicated, right, to try to um, help students not just get an exposure to Ojibwe Moen, but to to become speakers, right? There's all kinds of guys. There's all kinds of uh, right Ojibwe language programs, and you know we teach it in the schools, teach it in uh, some of the uh, educational programs or whatnot. Um, but helping your students become speakers, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother game, right? Right. It's one thing you take a class. It's another, a whole nother question to, uh, um, become a speaker and be able to speak it and speak it to your kids and have conversations. And, um, so, all right. So, you know, so I, I, I decided, you know, it could be, um, you know, what we talk about today, I mean, I, I could say a bunch of things and make you feel warm and fuzzy inside, or or I could tell you the truth, which you guys, you can't have both. Either you want the truth or you want to feel good about stuff. <laughs> I'm, you know, let's just be honest, guys. I'm going to be honest with you guys. Language revitalization is hard work. Man, I don't know how many times I've cried myself to sleep, right? I don't know how many times I've quit right I used to be an immersion uh, an immersion teacher for preschool kids man I quit like every week once <laughs> working as an Ojibwe language immersion teacher for kids for preschool kids and um you know and learning the language itself right so get it so let me make this clear 
Getting a PhD in linguistics does not mean I got a PhD in Ojibwe language, right? I had to learn to speak Ojibwe, right? Linguistics doesn't teach me how to learn, speak Ojibwe. I had to do that work. That's a separate thing that I had to do. So that's why I was doing my graduate work. I was working with elders, but the linguistics gave me the technical ability, right? The technical ability to learn the language. To uh, Now, do you need linguistics to learn the language? No, of course not. Um, but guys, um, it's difficult because Ojibwe is an endangered language. It's, uh, and when we're in this endangered language uh, context, language learner sometimes if if we're not kind of i don't know um if we're left to our own devices we start changing the language a little bit and it starts the language starts to morph into english or it starts to resemble english okay so um that has been and that ojibwe there's two types of ojibwe that we're learning um in, in my opinion the first one is really easy to learn and it's and it resembles English, and that's the one that's uh, being taught and learned by a lot of language learners. And I call that Ojibwe 1.0. Ojibwe 1.0 underlyingly looks like English. The word order looks like English. Its systems looks like English, even though you're speaking Ojibwe. It it you know native speakers, first language speakers, when they hear you talk, they know, right? Oh, they'll say this too. Oh, he's He's thinking in English, right? So that Ojibwe Moen or that Anishinaabe Moen is easy to learn and it's easy to master, right? And, and what that means is a form. I don't know. I'm going to start using a little bit language learner terminology, but that means a form is sentences, B forms are subordinate clauses, and C forms are nouns, right? I wish that were true. Also, it also means that Ishkwa means after, Right. I don't know how many of you guys are. Um, I'm going to get on the soapbox a little bit, but there are other things other than this that we kind of go off the rails. But let me give you an example. That's a big example. Some of you might be language learners. I'll put it in the chat here. I'll put it in the chat here. Um, there's this preverb, um, Ishkwa. And this is poor Ishkwa has been labeled, has been labeled. Um, with an English concept of after. And in English, we have this word after. It's so convenient, guys. It's so convenient, guys. Um, but you'll be surprised to know that a lot of languages in the world don't have a word for after, per se, right? There's always a way. Every language has a way of saying it. But not every language has a word for it. For example, not every language has a word for if. Right. Not every language has a word, but there, there is a way to say it. It's usually how you conjugate the word or how you say the phrase that gives it that that meaning. So. All right. So what has happened, guys, over the I don't know. I don't know how long this has happened, but it's got to stop. <laughs> it's got to stop. And I know some of your language learners. And right now, Ishqua means after is part of your soul right now. It's part of your soul. And you're right now you're thinking, I don't know if I believe you. I'm not sure. I learned this in school. I learned this in a, you know, in a book or in a language or a, this a person taught me. And just by some of you smiling right now, I know you're guilty. You're thinking, I don't know if I believe you. Right. But let me prove it to you. I'm going to prove it to you. And even having, having proved it, proven it to you, you still might be holding on to this. Ishqua means after. OK, but I'm here to tell you, though, Ishqua does not mean after. In fact, I was working with one of the elders at um, Wabagoon Lake up in Canada there. And I asked her and, I, you know, I already knew the answer, but I just wanted to see what she said. I said, hey, how do you say, how do you say after he left? And she goes, there's no word for after. And I was like, I know, right? <laughs> I know, right? All right, so let me prove it to you guys for you naysayers. Um, naysayers, that's, not, you're not naysayers. It's just, <laughs> if you don't believe me. All right, so let's do, let's, let me, I'll do it in the chat here. So, um, let's see. Uh, we want to say something like after 
Okay, uh, but to be fair, there is a time place when we use a schwa, but it doesn't mean it means after. Okay, guys. So here's here's how it works. To say after I I ate, right? After I ate, yeah, yeah. You could say guy schwa, guy schwa, we me on. Touche. I got you. I'm on board, right? Guy schwa, we send me on. So if you want to say guy schwa, we send me on, or a schwa, we send me on, you could say a schwa, we send me on, or guy schwa, we send me on. Um, don't even get me started about and then, but um, I'll put in, let's put it in a bigger constant. Guy, guy, guy schwa, we send me on, right? Guy uh, shouldn't buy on. So that's kind of like saying after I, after I ate, I went to sleep, right? Okay. Great, we're good. That fits your that fits that if you know ishqua, if if ishqua means after, then that fits your paradigm and we're good, right? We're feeling good. But let's do another word. Let's how would you say after he left? After he left. So if we try to apply the same what we with what we did with eating, if we try to apply the same rule, we would get uh gai shkwa ma jayan in the chat there. Gaish Kwama Jayan is actually incorrect. It's actually not a native speaker pattern. Um, now, how do I, so if you wanted to say after he left, typically you would say Gama Jayan. Just Gama Jayan, Ganeshi, Gama Jayan, Ganeshi, Jayan, it would be Wama Ting, right? As opposed to Gaish Kwama Jayan, which is a little bit, it's a little bit awkward. Now, how do I know this guy? <laughs> Uh, like, how would you say something like, after I found it, after I found it, right? After I found it, after I found your phone, I called you, right? After I found your phone, for example, uh, I called you. Now, you, I, I, you could try to say, gosh, come on. But it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit awkward, right? So, because a shkwa really means stop, right? So with words like, you know, so really what's more appropriate, at least for, you know, Southwestern Ojibwe, I mean, I can't speak for every single dialect. And maybe some dialects a shkwa has, has actually developed into after. Now there is that possibility, right? But I've been all over Shanab country, man. It's the same, right? So after I found your phone, right? It wouldn't be Gai Shkwami Kaman, typically. It would be Gai Shkwami Kaman. Gai Shkwami Kaman. Right? So I'll put it in the chat. Gai Shkwami Kaman. Gai Gigi Gigi Dobi Wabi Ku Bi Wabi Kun Sim. Right. Uh sorry, After I found your phone. All right, now. So both of those statements. Gosh, well, we send me on. Perfect. Perfect. Fine. There's an ishwa in there. Gosh, we send you after I got done eating. Got me come on. Also, after I found it. All right. So, so that that's good. That's good shanab right there. That's good Ojibwe right there. Um, but one has a shkwa in there, the other one doesn't. But they both both mean after. So that means that ishqua cannot mean after. Because and after I found it, there's no ishwa in there. So what is it? about those phrases that mean, that give it this meaning. So if there's no word, there's no preverb per se um, for after, then what is giving it, it that meaning? Well, we've, you know, what it, and the, what that is, what, what's giving it that meaning is the initial change. So when I ask students, what part of gosh, well, we see now means after, right? Um, the, the answer is the ga. The fact that gi changed to ga, right? That's what gives it its nuance. Same thing in gama jayan. Gani ma jad, gani ma jad. After he left, the fact that there's initial change on the ga, 
right? Not on the gi. That's what gives it its nuance. So it's not a word per se. Um, come on, come on. And then I found it, right? I should make come on, right? Um, I would interpret that as, and then I found it, right? But don't get me started on and then. Let's do, you want to do and then? <laughs> Guys, I can give you many examples of how we just, we just, you know. <laughs> uh, oh, then it, the optics said, yep. <laughs> All right, so all right, so Ishqua is one. So, but okay, guys, though, um, but lo, those of you that are language learners, you know that that's what's being taught. Ishqua means after. Well, it it has a nuance like that in certain contexts, but what's the difference? I, I mean, we can get into the linguistics of it, but because um, what's the difference between Gashwa Wisinian Gama Jayan? Well, it's the verb, the verb itself. Think of it this way: I tell my students this: if you can do the the verb, if you can do it all day long, you need a stop pre-verb. You need an ishkwara gishi. Well, that's what I'm explaining, yes. So think about the word we sani. Here she's eating, right? That word does not imply an endpoint. You could eat all day long, right? I mean, you don't have the physical ability to, but you could. The word itself doesn't imply an endpoint, but uh, the word, reach in, in English, reach. I reached the summit. That word reach implies an endpoint, right? So when you, so find, the word find implies an endpoint. I found it. You never say I kept finding it though, or I stopped finding it. Why, how, why is it even weird in English to say I stopped finding it, right? Because, because once you found it, it's over. So you don't need to stop it. You can't find it all day long. You can rice all day long. You can eat all day long. You can drink all day long, right? But you cannot find it all day long. Once you found it, you, you can't wake up all day long. Once you're up, you're up. So test, quiz, quiz. How do you say after I woke up this morning? Put it in the chat, please. After I woke up, I'll give you the word. He or she wakes up, but you gotta you gotta fill in the rest. After I woke up this morning, I got on. You got it. Or on. Either way, you got it. on. You would not say guy on. Why? Because once you wake up, you can't stop waking up or you can't keep waking up. It's over once you're done. So in linguistics, we call this telicity. Every word has a implies an endpoint or not. Now, as native speakers of English, most of you or all of you, right? You have a you have a natural ability to tell tell the difference. You know that, but you don't know it on the surface. Okay. Native speakers of Ojibwe know this about their own language, about um uh, about Ojibwe. They naturally know when to use an ishqua because you need a stop preverb. For, or Giji, Ishkwa is not the only one, guys. Giji is also one. So you can say, Gakiji, Gakiji, we send you on. Gakiji, we send you on. Now, Gashkwa, we send you on. Gakiji, we send you on. Now, and, but we don't always use Ga if it's past. That's only if it's past tense, guys. If it's past tense. If it's unrealized future, Gikoshkozian. Gikoshkozian is when I was. Kind of like when I when I woke up, um, you could get away with that. There's a time and place for it. Usually you use that initial change, especially if you're going to say, and uh, after I woke up, I ate. So usually it, it sounds more appropriate sometimes to say, as opposed to gikoshkozian, right? Because even gakoshkozian, let me, so if you say something like this, gakoshkozian, this can mean a few things, guys. It can mean after, when, as soon as I woke up, right? So it's not really after per se. There's no after, right? It's just once the event, the event got completed, once it got done, Right, I verb. 
Migashi, Migashi, oh God, Migashi, Miganishi Machayan or something like that. I left or something like that. I don't know. All right, cool. Uh, but what about for future? Future unrealized events. You can't use God or whatever. There's no initial change. So if you're going to say, after I eat, right, after I get done eating, right, of course, we, um, yes, we see, we see a squaw there, right, after I eat, okay, but guys, it, don't let it fool you, a squaw doesn't mean after, it just means stop, you're, or get done, right, so when you say a squaw, we say, yeah, and you're saying, when I get done eating, but if I say, when I, uh, when I leave, after I leave, from this point on in the future, unrealized future, you wouldn't say Ishkwa Ma Jayan. You would just say, right, to say, you would just say Ma Jayan after I leave. But that doesn't necessarily mean after necessarily, it just means after I leave, when I leave, right? It's unrealized future. So there's no initial change, no stop preverb because Ma Jaw, once you let, once you Ma Jaw, you Ma Jaw, right? You can't keep Ma Jaw all day long, right? If you can ma jaw all day long, well, then use a squaw then. <laughs> Knock yourself out. But, you know, once you've left, you left, right? When you leave your ex, right? <laughs> well, okay, maybe that's a little different. <laughs> you can, you know how you keep coming back, whatever, um, to your ex. <laughs> so I guess you can keep, but that's reduplication, ma ma jaw. Get ma ma jaw. <laughs> Something different. All right, guys. So anyway, that's one example where we've kind of gone off the rails to make Ojibwe or Nishnape Moen to, to look like and sound more like English, right? It's when we do it that way, when we do it that way, we, now nobody's woke up one morning and, and did this with and curled their mustache and did it on purpose, okay? It's just a natural, right, in English, you don't realize in English, we have this word after. So we, therefore, we think every other language in the world must have a word for after, right? But Ojibwe just doesn't have, have to. Um, yeah, even with time, even with time, you can do initial change on time. Neso Dubai can make, right? Neso Dubai, you do it on time frames. A shkwa na quake. So like if I, if, I went to, if I went to school on Friday, or um, let's see, or I went to, uh, let's see, I went to the store on um Sunday afternoon, right? If I went to the store, I went to the store um, on Sunday. It's going to blow your mind, guys, because it's not just, right? I went to the store on Sunday afternoon to say, because it's a past event. I went to the store on Sunday afternoon, right? You have to say, um, right? Gi, anamae, gi, she got. Right. And then on it's it's on Sunday, this past Sunday, in the afternoon. Which one is it? Ishkwa Nawa Quake or Ashkwa Nawa Quake? Which one is it? Ishkwa Nawa Quake or Ashkwa Nawa Quake? Put in the chat. Put in the chat. What do you think? Oh snap. Oh, <laughs> Vicky's got an E prefix. All right, we're not dealing with E prefixes. <laughs> if you're an E prefix user, um, all right, uh, I'll put you on the back burner. Put you back on the back burner. Now, some people are saying I would use A. Now, A, that E prefix is used as, an, uh, as a device for initial change. Um, our, our dialect here, we would say A squa, now a quake. On sat if, if it's past this past Sunday, yeah, no me gi shik a squa no me a squa no a quake. Um, now, if you use an e prefix, that makes sense too because it would probably you know sometimes e surfs uh, acts like initial initial change. You wouldn't say ishqua no a quake though in this case. You would not say if we're talking about past Sunday. You wouldn't say yeah no me gi shigak ishqua no quake because ishqua no quake is is the ishqua no a quake coming up. This this afternoon, that's that's Ishkwana Quake. That's this afternoon, okay. All right, all right, guys. But we're not here to teach uh, the, the the finer details of initial change. That's just an example. Uh, Nancy's okay now. All right, <laughs> she her head almost exploded. Um, 
So that's one example where that, because that ishqua got labeled as after, it's easy to teach, it's easy to understand, easy to use, uh, but I would argue it has lost its soul, right? It's lost its soul. It, 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 it's one aspect that resembles English now, right? Where now, and if and if we teach our students that ishqua means after everywhere, and we use ishqua after everywhere, then what happens is we are disregarding a system of initial change that's been there for centuries. Initial change is ancient. It's in Kickapoo, it's in Meskwaki, it's in all the sister languages. It's not a new thing. It's an ancient system. And so when we just relegate, right, Ishqua and label Ishqua as being after guys, we lose part of the language. And, and, and some people might say, well, isn't that okay? <laughs> uh, maybe it is. On a, I mean, as long as they're talking Ojibwe, is that okay? And some people might be okay with that. Um, I personally am not okay with that because uh, the initial changes throughout the whole, in, in, in fact, I mean, the example we just saw with Sunday afternoon, right? That a squaw, that initial change on a squaw now a quake, for example, right? That means you lost that. You lost that system. You're losing this whole system. Um, all right. So anyway, that's one example, guys. That's one example. Uh, all right. Anyway, so I call that one, Ojibwe 1.0. Ojibwe 1.0, easy to learn, easy to teach, um, easy to master, because it looks like, under, underlyingly, looks like English. Okay. All right. So that's not what we're teaching here at the U of M. I don't know why anybody else teaching. Maybe you're not teaching that either, <laughs> wherever you're at. And especially if you're a first language speaker, you're, you're good, right? I'm not worried about the first language speaker teachers. They're good. They're awesome. Love them. Got to have them. Wish they were here. Whatever. I wish they were bunk mates with me. Good. It's the second language learner speakers, <laughs> okay, right? And I mean, I'm, when I point at you, I'm I got three pink fingers pointing at me, guys. I'm in the same boat, so I don't want you to think I'm, you know, wagging my finger at anybody. Uh, this is a, something that as second language speaker uh, teachers, we have to be very dil diligent about how we teach a language because we might be right inadvertently disregarding parts of the and native speakers guys first language speakers the instant you start speaking they can tell they can tell oh yeah they don't know that oh yeah they don't know that oh yeah they don't know that part oh that's not right i wouldn't say it that way but i'm not going to correct them because they'll, they'll you know they'll uh follow they'll cry themselves sleep tonight you know you know what i mean native speakers first language speakers are not going to correct you on every single thing <laughs> right so uh before um, okay, so someone's asking, does it apply to the word before? Now, there's actually no initial change. Uh, some, um, there's Dubois, uh, Jibois, Dubois, for example, some uh, for before. That one's a little bit different. That that just that is an actual just a preverb. Now, bois, it's kind of crazy. Bois, it Jabal is actually two words that kind of came together. Bwa in like Panawatomi, for example, means it's negative, it's negative B form. It's negative B form. So it's like if you want to say, um, uh, I wish I, I'm glad I didn't win, right? In in Potawatomi, they would say something, Nimin Wayne Dum, Nimin Wayne Dum, Bwa Baka Nage, Baka Nage on. Right, that bois there, I'm glad I didn't win. Bois right there means that I didn't win, right? But in most Ojibwe dialects, that developed into before, this concept of before. So now that je, right? I, you know, je comes from, je is old too. Je comes from the future tense, right? It's actually before and future tense and je bois. So, Future tense je and bwa together or de bwa together have come to mean before. And you just use, so that one's fine, guys. Uh, no, no arguments with de bwa or je bwa. Like je bwa ma jayan, but it's just B form. You can't put tense with it. It's a tenseless grammar construction. So you, to say before I ate, past tense, you just say je bwa ma jayan or je bwa wisinyan. 
There's no other thing you don't need to put. You wouldn't say Jabois Guy Wissignan or something like that. Okay, even for future. Ooh, yeah. All right, don't get me started on future, right? Everybody trying to put we on everything. <laughs> like when you say um, on on this coming Friday, people want to, sometimes we want to say we nano gishigak, right? We nano gishigak on Friday, but you don't need the we guys. Just say nano gishigak because B form itself is future unrealized. Nano gishigak is the one coming up. That's why we don't say we wabung. We don't say we wabung. How come we don't say we wabung? Because <laughs> because it's B form future wabung is the B form of wabun. Wabun is A form. Wabung is tomorrow. But some, some as language learners, we memorize it as a particle or something like that, and so we think we got to say we, right? So we wouldn't say that. All right, cool. All right. Well, anyway, that's one example, um, guys. I didn't want to turn it into a, a language lesson, but guys, I could do it all day long. <laughs> language lessons. All right. So anyway, um, but how did, so how did we get there? How did we figure this out? Well, um, and it's interesting uh, as, um, as a linguist, right? Uh, linguistics and linguists kind of have a bad reputation, especially among uh, Dakota people or other languages. I mean, I, I've even heard things like linguistics doesn't have a place in language revitalization. <laughs> I've heard that. People say that people have a grudge against linguistics and for and for good reason, for good reason. There's a good reason for that. Um, you know, probably 100 years ago or even 50 years ago, uh, linguists were primarily uh, white people who were just language junkies. And, and they go into a community and they work with a native speaker or a first language speaker, get this data, go and leave the reservation, write their papers, present those papers to other white people at a conference. And, you know, and, and they do it as part of their research. And, you know, and that and that product that they made was not necessarily, it, it, it's, it's put into a linguistics orthography that really makes it unpractical for actual language learning purposes or whatever. So it's not really useful. Or there's been instances where, uh, the people from the reservation can't get access to that information. Um, so there's there's good reasons and precedents for that. Um, but I'm not a white linguist. I'm an indigenous linguist, right? You know, I you know, so everything I I I figure out, I try to figure out and and write papers. I, yeah, I write papers, guys, and I go to the conferences and present papers to other linguistic nerds, and we nerd out on little bitty linguistic things. I mean, yeah, uh, I still do that. Um, but why, but why am I doing it? I do it because we're trying to, we're trying to figure stuff out. I'm not doing it for the papers guys. I don't care about the publications personally. Right. Um, I, I only care about the publications to the extent that it, it, it make, it helps me to make sure that my analyses are correct. Guys, I've, I've, I've tried to publish papers and I was wrong about Ojibwe. There were certain things about Ojibwe. I'm trying to figure out that I was wrong about and, it, and, and the reviewers, you know, said, you're wrong about this. And they were right, right? I was heartbroken, cried myself to sleep, but I, you know, got back on the horse and I figured it out why I was wrong. You know, and that's science, guys. That's that's what linguistics, it's a science, right? You got it, you make a hypothesis. So you're trying to figure something out. You make a hypothesis. You try to, you know, use the data or whatever to figure it out. And, you know, sometimes you're right, sometimes you're wrong. And, but that's why we have peer review. Peer, the, our peer, the peer review make, keeps us honest. Right. Hopefully, hopefully, unless you're your own editor of your own journal, then that's that's a little bit. Um, uh, that's not good. All right. I won't say his name, but <laughs> if you're an editor of your own journal and you're publishing in your own journal. All right. Most of the stuff in there are probably not publishable, but, you know, you're the editor, so you can publish whatever you want. Right. All right. All right, guys. So anyway, um, why, so what are we doing here? How do we get to that point, right? Because my background is in linguistics, our program at the University of Minnesota, um, we're, we're not just teaching the language, but we're trying to figure things out, right? We're trying to figure these things out so that we can get it to the students. That's the whole point. Figure something out that we don't know or understand yet, get it to the students so that they can learn it and, and uh, use it in their own language. Because man, I don't want four years of instruction of Ojibwe and they walk out those doors and the language they're speaking resembles English. It's lost its soul, right? I don't want that. 
right? If they leave, you know, speaking Ishqua means after and yada, 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 you know, and they're fluent in that, man, I, I don't know. I'm not sure I've done my job, right? But it's it's hard to get there because it does require a little bit of research. You have to, and you don't have to be a linguist, guys. You could just be a language learner, but just pay attention to the facts. Pay attention to um, what the native speakers, the first language speakers are saying, right? Don't, don't, don't learn something in the class and think that the teacher who taught you in the class has everything figured out. And I think, I think that's what a lot of language learners come to the table. They, they come to learn the Anishinaabe Moen or Ojibwe Moen, and they think that, oh yeah, I'm, a, I'm just going to walk into a class and they're just going to hand it to me. Right. Um, you know, we all think that, but the problem is it's not all figured out. Right, especially if the teacher's giving you uh, Jipway 1.0 stuff, it's not figured out, and um, and there's so much more, guys. There's so much more. Squaw is just one of the examples. There's um, some of the things that I notice in language learner speech. Some of the things I notice. Number one, initial change. Initial change, busted. It's not there. It's not there, or we have a, or or we're only using initial change to make nouns. Okay, we're only using or a prefix to make nouns. Okay, but there's these other uses. Discourse markers, largely absent from for, uh, second language learner speech. Discourse markers are the little things like um, they're attitude markers. They're like, um, <clears throat> um, uh, the, for example, um, gosha, sa, anish, right? Not the question particle anish. The, the discourse marker on each. Gosha, uh, shago, all those little discourse markers, right, that give attitude and um, nuance to phrases, those are largely uh, gone from second language speaker speech. Um, how we tell stories. Language learners, this is a typical language learner, tells stories this way. Ingi, minawa, ingi, mi dash, ingi, minawa, ingi. Minawagi, Minawagi. Yeah, me dash gi. Okay. <laughs> it's right. Everything is a form. When they try to tell a story, everything is a form. So in other words, right, they'll say, Ingi we sin, minawa, ingi neba, minawa, minawa, ingi, yada yada yada, right? But Ojibwe stories, Sanab stories don't work that way. There is a structure, right? Background information is usually a form, and then the, the actual storyline are more conjunct oriented, right? So, you know, gajis, for example, when you want to say and then, you know, gajima, jayan, gaji. Okay, I'm losing people. I'm losing people. All right, um, let's move on. Uh, how are we doing on time? All right. Um, so, those are some of the linguistics linguistic aspects that were, um, an, well, another one that we're kind of don't understand quite a bit is buns. Um, you guys hear the buns? You guys hear buns in Ojibwe? All right, raise your hand if you know how to use buns. Expert level. All right, raise your hand if you have zero idea what, I, what a bun is. <laughs> you guys know buns, right? We all know buns, especially at Wabagoon Lake, they know buns. Yeah, so. Um, all right, that's another one that's not very, so I'll give you a few examples, because bun, um, I don't know, guys, let's turn into language lessons, I don't, I don't know if that's interesting or not, but, um, yeah, I don't know, well, for example, buns, 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 all right, <laughs> someone likes buns, especially out east in, in the North Bay, they got, they got, uh, they got cinnamon buns out there. We it's crazy. They say we snim bun. They say we snim bun. All right, I'll give you an example. Um, so if you say something like, "What is bun?" Bun, we call that we call that a we call that a counterfactual. What a counterfactual! Uh, in linguistics, sometimes bun has been labeled as a preterite or something like that. Uh, but bun is a counterfactual. What's a counterfactual? Counterfactual. You know, you guys. I know some of your heads just exploded. Don't worry about it. You know what it is. When someone says something like, had he been good looking, I would have dated him, but his face is busted. All right, so that, had he been good looking, 
were he look good looking? That's a counterfactual. In other words, it's counter to facts, <laughs> right? It's counter to reality, right? Had you had you eaten this morning? Well, some of you guys say if you ate this morning, I wouldn't say it. it sounds ungrammatical in English to me, but some of you are saying if you ate this morning, you wouldn't be hungry right now. I would say had you eaten this morning, that's a counterfactual, right? Well, that's that's one of the functions of bun in Ojibwe. So if you wanted to say had you eaten this morning, or if you ate this morning, right? Don't use geesh bin, guys. Oh my God. Okay, here's another one. Here's another one, guys. Soapbox alert. Okay. But first, we have to talk about English. We have to talk about English, English dialects. And some of you speak this dialect. And I'm thought, and um, let's see. Did oh, I'm sorry. My my hang on for a sec. Hang on for a sec. Uh, my chat is going to one specific person. Hang on. All right. So when I say bun, it's a counterfactual. Um, so we have to talk about English dialect. So when you say something like that, guys, how many of you guys raise your hand if you say, had you eaten this morning? How many would you say it that way in English? None of you or one of you. Holy. OK. What? How many of you would say if you ate this morning, you wouldn't be hungry right now? There you go. There you go. What? What's wrong with you guys? That's wrong. <laughs> I'm teasing. It's not. It's a different dialect. It's it's a even in English, right? We have dialect differences. So, and I'm just teasing you guys when I say it's incorrect. Uh, but but it's gonna jack you up when you try to speak English. Uh, trying to speak Shanab. When you try to speak Ojibwe, your English dialect is gonna mess you up. Why? Because in your head you're thinking if. And then in somewhere you learn that if is gishpin. And so then you're going to say this. I'm going to put it in the chat, guys. Do, do not write this down and memorize this because it's incorrect. But you're going to say this. Gishpin gi we siniyan. All right. Right. You're going to say gishpin gi we siniyan. That would be that would be ungrammatical. For a first language speaker, you don't you wouldn't really say it that way. Right. Maybe you could get away with it. Maybe a native speaker would allow you to say that or whatever. But really, that right there, again, is another example where it matches your English, but it doesn't really match Ojibwe. So in Ojibwe, we would say, at least around here, but I'm pretty sure everybody. <laughs> I've been North Bay, guys. I've been in North Bay. They're the same thing, except they're cinnamon buns. So here's how we would say it here, right here. We we would say, we see bun. Had you eaten, I'll put it the other dialect, if you had eaten, right? Oop, Eastern, I'm sorry. Yes, the means is slang to me. Modern spin, all right. I, I, okay, a lot of elders hate meigs, guys. They hate they hate meigs, but okay, knock yourself out. Um, so how you would say that in Ojibwe is, we siniambun, we siniambun, you guys see it? We siniambun, I don't know where mine went. Uh, we sin, we siniambun. Yummy buns, guys. Just remember, yummy buns. We see neon bun. That's how you say it. We see neon bun. Had you eaten or if you had eaten. Um, in North Bay, they say we see neon bun. We see neon bun. We see neon bun. Which sounds like cinnamon buns. So here we have yum buns and they have cinnamon bun. All right. No more jokes. Nobody. These are the jokes, folks. These are the jokes. No need to add me to it. You wouldn't say me. You don't need to add me in this case. Me has a me has another function. Me has a, is a pointer. It's a long stick with a little hand on it that points to things. Me ill it it points to things, time, and emotions. Um, so not in this case. All right, guys. So that's bun. Uh, but there's but that's only in B form. If you do it in A form, right? Like um I was, I was, I was sleeping. I was sleeping like when you called last night or something like that. There you go. There's another one with in a statement. Um, now a lot of people try to get it. A lot of language learners try to try to get away with when they want to say I was sleeping. People try to get away with ingi neba. But ingi naba doesn't mean I was sleeping. Ingi naba means I slept. I went to sleep. I slept. 
when you want to say I was sleeping continuative in the past when you called me last night, right? You would say, right? That's when I sleep. When I sleep. That's future unrealized, typically. Future unrealized, or I suppose, you know, when I sleep, but I was sleeping. I was sleeping when you called last night, right? You that usually use a bun for that. When you right? Or I was working. I was working, right? When you when you came in, right? Something like that. All right, guys. That's bun. I mean, it's not a class on bun, but you know, you guys wanted to talk about buns, especially at Wabagoon Lake. They like to talk about buns a lot. <laughs> All right, guys. So uh okay what else so this is but guys how do we come get to this point the linguistics right the linguistics training over the years just over the years uh myself you know working with elders and noticing that language learners why the way we're teaching it in classes and language tables and whatnot um and the way that the native speakers the first language speakers are speaking i notice over the years that there's quite a few differences quite a few and so uh, someone asked about, well, how do we, um, are we going to, uh, do you have a hope that our language is going to be survive intact with proper language maintenance, as you've talked about with this squad as an example? P.S. It drives me batty when people say me instead of me. <laughs> and boosh, right? Boosh. Now, uh, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, people are playing with it. People, people, uh, elders hate it, but, you know. Young people, they're they're all right, you know, amongst themselves. Um, well, that, that's the struggle, guys. That's just are we? Is it going to survive intact? That's the fear. That's the fear. I mean, um, if you're not vigilant about your language learning and working with these elders, and and paying attention to what might be English. Right. I mean, they're the model, right? The, the first language speakers, they they are the model. If you're not, if you the goal is to understand everything they're saying, right? That's the standard, right? And the way they say it, can you predict? And would you say it that way yourself? Right. And, and if the answer is yes, you're on the right track. But if the elder says it in a way that's contrary to how you would say it. You're the one that needs to change, not the elder. Okay, too many times language learners, we again, for some reason, when we learn it in a classroom or we learn it in a book, somehow that takes precedence, right? Even somehow that takes precedence over real world language. And so sometimes when we hear an elder, for example, they didn't use ishqua to mean after, but I learned ishqua means after, therefore the elder must be wrong, guys. They're not. They grew up speaking it, right? Can you imagine somebody coming from over from China saying I'm speaking English wrong? Yeah, right. Someone from the Ukraine tried to tell me that. Someone from the, from Ukraine tried to tell me, you know, tried to tell me I was saying something in English wrong. I'm like, I've been here my whole life. I, I don't think so, right? So so we have to be vigilant. And um, linguistics linguistics training helps. Um, guys, um, If I always say this. Is it necessary? No. But does it help to have a linguistics nerd in the community? A nerd that, you know, glasses, you know, a little, you know, with their little calculator. Yes. Right. Man, let them figure it out. They'll let them go into the nerdery and figure this stuff out and come back out and let you know. <laughs> right. I've had people tell I've had students tell me that, you know, because I, I realized over the years that not, not every student gets uh, gets down with the ling linguistics. They don't really want to figure anything out. That's fine. Um they said, well, you figure it out and you get back to us. <laughs> and I'm like, OK, all right, that's the way it is. Some people are naturally inclined to try to figure out the mysteries and other people just give me the answer. <laughs> that's fine. Either, fi either one's fine, guys. So at least one, though, you got to have at least one linguistics nerd, you know, or I, or I would recommend one so that somebody is keeping everybody honest. Otherwise, romance starts to creep. Oh, oh my God. All right. Roll, uh, soapbox alert coming. All right, here we go. I'm gonna put it in the map. Ojibwe romance. 
So here's, I, I, I had to type it out, guys. So I could just look at it and hate it, right? Um, hate's a strong word, and I mean to use it. <laughs> All right, so what do I mean by Ojibwe romance? So, okay, so on Facebook, I don't know, I don't know. Anyway, somewhere along the way in this endeavor to learn our language, right? Um, Tiffany hates it too. All right. But let me give you an example of what this is. But somewhere along the way, in this journey of trying to get our language back, all of us who are language learners, somehow we too have bought into the hype, right? Us too. I, I know you don't like to admit it. I think a lot of us want to believe that we're not colonized. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure you use toilet paper this morning. And I'm pretty sure you use a little bit of that eye contact. Loop. I mean, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, uh, I don't know, unless you went out to the woods and used leaves. I mean, you know, your English is part of your soul. So, um, but somehow we bought into the romance. And I remember one elder in our community used to say, she says, some people like to romanticize the culture, right? So we're saying some crazy stuff. You know, I see some crazy stuff. And so now there's this idea of we want to be able to say our language always knew this, right? Like our language always knew it was already embedded in the language that we knew uh, string theory and physics. Guys, Ojibwe language is a language like any other language in the world. It's on par with any other language in the world, right? If there's any secrets in there about physics, right? There might be, because every culture has science built in how you look at the world. Every culture, every language builds into how they view and how they, you know, interpret the world. So there is science embedded into it. Um, but I'll give you an example, guys, uh, where, so I'm not saying that there's no science in the language. I'm, there is, every language has it. Um, but this is how we go overboard, guys. For some reason, I don't know. Uh, let's look at um, let's look at a word that I've seen over on Facebook. Um, oh my! How much how much time do we got? Oh, okay, we're running out of time, but I got I got too much, man. Um, one word is uh, mushko day. All right, so I've seen on Facebook where mushko day has been analyzed as uh, mushkao mush being strong plus day heart. All right, because Mushko, so therefore our people saw the prairie Mushko Day as being strong of heart. You guys ever seen that on Facebook? Yeah. Okay, guys, it's it's BS. <laughs> it's not it's not true, right? But I can see where they're coming from because they look at Mushko Day, they see day and they think, oh, that means date in date. First of all, my heart is in date with a glottal stop at the end. In date, you can't just in Ojibwe, you can't just say, oh, well, that's inconvenient. Let's erase the the, the glottal stop, right? So the in Mushko Day, that word day doesn't have anything to do with heart. Mushko, Mushko, um, what they're referring to as strong is the root mushkao. Mushkao, right? Is not mushko. Mushkao is a different mushko has to do with hard or strong right here. Um, so that's one example here. So it hasn't, the prairie has nothing to do with strong heart. Uh, what's another one? Um, shall we get into Zoggy and uh, Gijuanum? Gijuanum? Oh, let, one last thing we'll have, guys, let's talk about this because it's very important. Um, I don't even want to get into Buju and Ani, but <laughs> uh, uh, okay. And maybe maybe some of you guys don't believe me. That's okay. If you don't believe me, it's I. It's all right. But let's talk about um uh what was I gonna talk about? Buju and not not buju. I got sidetracked. Um oh man, what did I was gonna talk about? What did I just say? I kind of lost it. Zoggy, oh zoggy, a uh, love. Okay, let's talk about love. All right. So did you guys know? Because there's this, and Facebook too, Facebook, and I don't know about TikTok now, but there is this controversy. People get into debates about Zagi, Zagi in, and Kishawainamen, as how to say, I love you. 
And then some people say, well, you only say Gazagi into your romantic, romantic partners and you say Gishawainam into your kids. Guys, it's all BS. It's all BS. It's all BS. All right. So in fact, this is what happened. Ojibwe, for some reason, lost the word for love. It's gone. It's gone. Elders don't remember the word. It's gone. Somewhere, I don't know, somewhere down the road, it's lost. How do we know Ojibwe lost the word? Ojibwe or Snabe Moen lost the word for love. Um, because the other sister languages have it. Kickapoo, Meskwaki, Potawatomi, all have this word. I'll put it in the chat. Dabaj. That is the Algonquin word for love right there. So in Potawatomi, they don't say, they say, get up on in and kick a poo, get up on in. My grandma used to say that to me and only me because I was her favorite. Get up on in. Right? So in kick a poo, get, uh, get, get up on, get up on in. Right? Uh, in Potawatomi, get the on in. Right. I've asked elders all over, man, and, and they don't remember that word. They don't have that word in their vocabulary. It's gone, completely gone. But the sister language is all even Potawatomi, guys. Potawatomi is probably the most, the closest to Ojibwe Moen and Anishinaabe Moen. They even have it. Right. But Ojibwe, the Ojibwe dialects, uh, the Anishinaabe Moen dialects, it's gone. Where did it go? I have no idea. I have no idea where it went. Guys, it's just gone. So what happens when languages lose words, right, is they replace them. So some communities replaced it with uh, Zagi. And Zagi comes from Zazagazi. Um, he or she is stingy. Yes. <laughs> that So stingy, right, because, you know, when you're, you know, how many of you guys been at the powwow with your snag and you're like, Zagi, oh, you don't want to share your snag, you know, with anybody else or yours is August. But, you know, it, it, it especially at Wabagoon Lake, right? They're all as August over there. <laughs> anyway, I'm just teasing, you're not. Um, so that word eventually, that root, Zog, doesn't have to do with going out or anything like that, like pouring out. I saw that on TikTok. Someone was saying that Zoggy love has to do with pouring out, doesn't. It comes from Zazagi. So, uh, so Zog is a stingy, but it came to mean love. So you can use love for dialects, for communities that chose that word. They use it for all kinds of love, right? So Gizagi in, you can say it to your mom. Um, some guy on Facebook from Red Lake just said he loved me on my birthday, right? I'm not his romantic partner. He just, we're buds, we're boys, right? We're boys. I don't know. Uh, uh, well, anyway. So you can say Gazagi into your mom, your dad, your baby, your, your son, your boy, your girlfriend, whatever. Okay. But then some communities chose Shoenim. And Shoenim comes from pity, compassion. You know, in other words, in other words, the spirits did you a solid. So when you go out into the, you know, someone in stories, you go out into the woods and you got, you know, uh, stranded or whatever, and the little people, they get get, get, get Shoenim and good. The little people. They had pity on you and they helped you out of a bind. Okay, yeah. So some communities chose that word to mean love, right? So some communities say, them in. you know, you say that to everybody right here. And, um, but so now, but say everybody's confused because everybody's learning language from different sources, some from communities that chose Shawainim and other communities from other uh, sources that use Zagi, right? And now people are trying to figure out why, when, and where to use it. And so they've made up these rules that you can't say gazagi into your, your father. Um, I've had a, Tiffany says, I've had a friend of me tell me, because she wait a minute. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you know, anyway. So, okay. So anyway, guys, um, that's why it's my whole point here, and I, we're gonna have we're gonna open up for uh, questions here. But that's why, um, as language learners, you got to stay vigilant. You can you always have to question um, what you think you know about the language. What always gauge what you're saying at what comes out of your mouth compared to what's coming out of a native speaker's mouth. If you don't have native speakers or first language speakers around you, guys, we're losing them. There, there's gonna come a time. 
right? If I live to be an old man and I'm 28 right now, if I live to be an old man, right? I color, I color this in gray just for highlights. But if then we're going to see, at least Minnesota, we're going to see the last remaining first language speakers pass away. Guys, that's scary, right? And, um, but that's, but it's, that's difficult because uh, once they're gone, guys, we don't have, we won't have anybody to ask, you know? So that means we got to learn these, not just words, guys, words. I always say, I don't care about words. You need them, but you can't just learn words and expect you're going to be fluent. You have to learn the systems. You have to learn the systems, uh, buns, dogs, the grammar patterns, when and where to use A form, B form, C form. Um, you got to know those systems. You got to know how to use buns. You got to know how to use dogs, when and where, what their purposes are. You got to know the particles, right? You got to know the particles. Uh, so, so the language goes further than, oh, you say gazagi in and I say kashawainam in. Those are petty differences. The bigger differences are deeper and more severe. That we, if we lose those systems, guys, if you're just, if you're learning the language, guys, that's why I tell people, don't, if you're going to learn Ojibwe, um, Nishnabe Moen, don't forget about anything else. <laughs> forget about other languages. Some people say, I'm going to learn Dakota and Ojibwe. No, you're not. You're going to suck at both. Promise you. Because the amount of time it takes to become fluent, fluent meaning you can use a language. You, you can use it intelligently. You can use it like native speakers per se. Now we're never going to be there. I mean, I, I'm, I'm make no mistake. I have no um, illusions that I'm ever going to arrive at a, you know, be as good as a first language speaker who's been speaking in their whole life. But I, I, I can try to figure out their systems, how they use it and predict. Right. And I can, you can, and you can work on your pronunciation. It's another thing we work in, we work on at the U of M. We work on pronunciation. We work on, uh, grammar. We work on everything. I know grammar is a bad word, but if you're not vil uh, vigilant, guys, your language is going, our language that we pass on to our kids is going to resemble more English than Ojibwe. And I, guys, if, if that's where we're at, if our whole, you know, Anishinaabe King, Anishinaabe with King community is happy with Anishinaabe Moen that looks like English underneath, guys, I'm done. There's no fight. That that we we're, we're already fluent in that. <laughs> we're already fluent in Ishqua equals after, right? And and when we're teaching that to our kids, we're we've we've passed on. Once you've passed that on to their your kids, that Ishqua means after. You don't have initial change. You don't know what bun is. You don't know when to use the the uh, dogs, for example, or the guains, or you don't know the grammar patterns. You don't know how to say even though, even though he's ugly. You don't know how to say. Um, because you don't know how to say even if what if what if he's ugly if you don't know how to say that if you don't know how to say uh, ask questions like uh, how much which one how far how long right you don't know how to do reduplication right if you don't know how to do reduplication in the language system gone it's gone buns gone do dogs gone on and then once you're and then initial change gone e prefix gone so and, and a lot of people are speaking that way and they're touting themselves as being fluent. They don't even know how to use buns. They don't know how to use ishqua. They don't know how to use whatever, right? For some reason, I call it the untouchable syndrome. Guys, it's a, it's a problem. Believe me, untouchable syndrome for our language learning community is when someone gets a command of the language and they can fool everybody around them. So they start feeling like this. Oh, I'm fluent. You can't teach me anything now. You can't, you can't, I'm, I know how, I know everything there is to know about the shrimp and business, right? That's the untouchables. And I've seen it in our community. I've seen it in other native tribe community, like Socket, Sac and Fox tribe community down in Oklahoma. I've seen it there, right? So get rid of the romance. Your first language speakers are the model. Get down and dirty. You got to get, you got to, you got to pester them, right? Get on text. Ask them how to say things while they're here. I know you're going to feel like you're going to be disrespectful to elders, but you're going to feel worse when they pass along and you're like, wish I would have asked her, right? You got to passion those elders. Hey, how do you say this? How do you say that? Right? I remember one of the, yeah, you know, that's okay. They're going to get, they're going to get annoyed with you from time to time. That's okay. Give them a break and then come back. 
<laughs> you see them at a conference, corner them. Hey, how do you say this? How do you say that? Right? You know, and you got to be keep, and you got to keep, you got to keep looking and asking questions. You got to get on. You got, if you don't, one one last thing will do question. And I know I said that two things ago, but um, as a language learner, you're um, you cannot let things go. The difference between a good language learner and a bad language learner, or a poor language learner, I would say. A good language learner, anytime they hear something they don't know, they ask about it, they write it down, they, they don't, they cannot let it go. A poor language learner, I don't understand it, oh well, oh I don't understand that, oh well, that right there, oh well, they let most words go, right? 99% of the words they hear, grammar patterns or whatever, they don't let go, either because but there's a reason for that guy. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but I'm saying you need to get over it because as language learners, as adult language learners, we have this big, oh, we have two problems. Big, oh, at least I did. Big gaping hole in our heart because we did, we weren't given the language. We don't have it. Guys, I have to acknowledge that. Big gape. If I'm the only one, I'll shut up, but I don't think I am. Big gaping hole in our heart and our identity right there because the language is not there. But the other problem is we also as adults have this big old ego. You don't, you feel stupid. You feel dumb. You guys got to get over that. Get over it. You're, you know, and it, it, just know that the person that you worship who speaks the language, they suck too. Okay. I don't care how long they've been working at the language. If they learn the language as an adult, whatever, and they're going around to conferences and everybody's like, oh, they speak the language, guys. They suck too. You can't fool a first language speakers. And first language, when they hear them, Right. I hear I hear what leg, first language speakers say about these people who are going around being famous fluent. They're saying the same thing I'm saying. They suck. <laughs> they don't. Well, they're not saying suck. They're saying, oh, they make a lot of mistakes. <laughs> all right. But I'm not saying that I don't make mistakes. We all make mistakes. But I'm just saying, uh, get rid of the romance. Listen to your first language speakers. Don't let things go. Be vigilant. And then and try to figure the language out. And if you have questions, ask your, your language learner friends. There's other friends. You, there are people in your community who have been that down that road already, right? But you got to keep them on us too. If what they're saying and what they're teaching doesn't match what the first language speakers are saying, they have work to do too, guys. And I, I'll be the first one to say that I have, I still are trying to figure things out. I still have work to do. I still have tons of questions before we lose our elders, right? Uh, until I'll be sad. I'll probably never be satisfied, but you know, we're on a clock here. So, all right, guys, that's it for me. Um, let's, uh, let's take some questions so we can end here in about 10, 11 minutes. Uh, um, how do we shift our teaching learning culture to a more truth focused one? How do we get organizations to buy and invest in this type of work? And then number one, organizations, communities, forget about them. Um, I, I've heard this in language revitalization if your community is not on board, your language revitalization movement will fail. Guys, that's false. It's BS. Uh, it starts with one person. One person has to decide, I'm going to learn this language once and for all. Make yourself, get out there. You got to do the work. You got. You can't go out there and expect someone to hand it to you. You got to go out there. You got to work with the elders. You got to get know, You got to get in uh, with these first language speakers and learn this language yourself. You first have to help you. You got to help you. Once you become, um, you know, highly proficient, right? You're always going to be learning. Like I'm going to always be learning. Then you can help other people and just make more of you. You got to make, but you got to. You can't do it if you're not if you're not fluent yourself, and you're trying to make other people fluent. It's not going to work. You're going to eventually kind of. It's going to. It's going to fizzle out. Whatever you're doing, it's going to fizzle out because there's nothing that's. You don't have the content. So you first work on you. Um, how do we shift? Again, the shift of how do we shift to teaching and learning culture? You just have to stay vigilant. You got to keep each other honest. You got to keep listening to your first language speakers. Read. You could, um, you know, work with your, you, you always got to be close to first language speakers. And we're not always going to have that privilege. That privilege is going to leave us someday. But while they're here, pester the hell out of them. Okay. Do it good. Do it in a good way. Give them some tobacco. But, you know. Um, whatever, pester them, learn, get on Facebook, text with elders. They'll text, they'll text with you in, in Ojibwe, right? But you got to do your part. Take classes if they're available. 
Um, see what else? The organizations, if you can get them to buy and invest in them, uh, great. But like I said, don't depend on it. Don't make don't make some an organization or the community uh, make it a break detail for you learning the language. At the at the at the end of the at the end of the day, it, it starts with you. In my opinion, in my opinion, you know, unless you can get a bachelor's degree program at your university, <laughs> right? But just because you have a bachelor's degree in the in the language doesn't mean it's good. Doesn't mean our program's good. So we have to we have to stay vigilant too. I have to make sure we meet once a year with my other instructors to make sure that what we're teaching is good, that it's it's um, it's you know really good quality language, right? We have to keep ourselves to a standard. Uh, did understanding linguistics make learning the language easier? And would that be a good way to get about getting a foundation? Yeah, um, it helped. Yeah, I mean, guys, people that do linguistics seem uh, appear to have a, a, a little bit more uh, facility to learn it. That's if you have the, the, the stomach for linguistics. <laughs> and linguistics classes are kind of, I'll be honest, when you take some linguistics classes, most of them are going to be theoretical and you're not going to see the point. And I didn't see the point in some of the classes, but I learned something from them. And having that linguistics tech, technic, uh, technical ability does help. Like I said, get, get, make one of your uh, community members a linguistics nerd and, and set them loose. And let them figure out all the little details and mysteries or whatever, and then they'll keep you honest. Um, so yeah, it that's what I used. I used ling linguistics to help me, and I still do. But you, but all that really gave me, and you don't need linguistics to do it. All it really gave me is a scientific um, mindset. What number one? What's the data? What are the elders saying? They're what they're saying. What's coming out of their mouth is king. So and queen, you got to. What they're saying is the model, but what they're saying is sometimes difficult to understand and, and to process. So uh, linguistics gave me the ability to look at, because I know about other languages in the world. I know about linguistics in general, about languages in the world, how they function, right? But if you just, you gotta, you gotta think about um, how languages work. That's, it's good to know how languages work. And um, you, as, a, as a human being, we don't, we're not aware of our own language. Uh, I guarantee it, you're not aware of your own language and you're not aware of vowel length. You're not aware of word order. You're not aware of those types of things. And so you, you kind of have to wake yourself up to kind of see the whole language as a whole and not just words, right? You can't be satisfied with, oh, I understood one word, therefore I'm making progress. Guys, you're not, <laughs> right? You have to um, really dig down deep and try to speak like speak like they're speaking the first language speakers okay any other questions guys um yeah uh let's see uh age age does something have have to do with it the older you get the way the older you get and the longer you wait to learn a language uh the more tears the more tears so don't wait if you're uh the 30 and over crowd Rough. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't do well for me. <laughs> but that's okay. That's okay, though. It's still possible. You're just going to have to put in a little bit more effort. <laughs> All right, guys. All right. If there's no other questions, I'll shut up, guys. This, I will say, miigwech. This, miigwech. This has been um, informative, enlightening, humorous. Um, I quite loved uh, some of the, the plays on words that you had. And certainly your interaction with all of us as your audience. Um, I did recognize some of the uh, people in the audience who are first language speakers and some who are um, second language speakers or, or reclamation um, of language perhaps. Um, but I, I think overall, we all enjoyed this. I had a chance to visit uh, your center back, I think in 2019, we had a group come from Lake Union University. And so I actually had a chance to, to come into the center in Duluth and, um, and visit with some of the uh, some of your colleagues. So that was really nice to have you join us here today. Um, I would like to uh, introduce our, our invite to Dr. Barnett back to the um, the group. He has a small but formal presentation uh, to make on behalf of the university before we move to the elder. Yeah, thanks so much, Denise. And I think are, are we putting something up on the screen okay. here as well? There we go. But uh, I, I would just like to first echo uh, what Denise was just saying that 
this has been an incredible presentation. Your energy and you're just an incredible speaker. I, I, I feel your students are incredibly lucky. Uh, and I think we've been lucky to have you join us here today. So on behalf of Lake Kid University, I would like to present uh, Dr. Brendan Kishkathan with this certificate of invited lecturer as a small token of our appreciation. And we do look forward to deepening our relationship with you. And thank you, Migwich. It's much appreciated. It's been fantastic. Thank you, Brendan. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I would like to invite um, Dr. Or sorry, Dr. Um, well, I guess an honorary doctorate, but uh, Elder Martin to do our closing for us today. Elder Martin. Migwich. Um, Thank you, Miigwech. Um, I always enjoy these linguists, even though they annoy me. Uh, with their fine points, uh, arguing amongst themselves, this no, but if you say this, yeah, but yeah. I've seen it before, and I'm glad they still have people around that understand the finer points of our language, and at least you can hear it. Uh, and that when you travel around with Anishinaabeg territory, you hear the variances in our language. And I try to tell young people and other learners about, don't get caught up in saying, you say tomato, I say tomato, um, which is good for you is good for you and use it. And don't just sit on the side and say, well, yeah, that sounds good. Okay, I understand that and never use it. And it's part of the problem with uh, our language is part of our medicines. Uh, it's like anything when you see it on somebody's wall in their home, unused uh, blade of sweet grass or sage, it's not being burned and used. It's meant to be used. And by using it, we try to heal the wounds of the past of a colonial people that say you have to learn French or English, two official foreign languages of our country. And I like saying that because it annoys the hell out of me because they are both official foreign languages. Um, and as long as I live, I'm going to still keep learning. I will never be a linguist, uh, perfectionist, or an expert. But like many of us older ones, we've learned that uh, we grew up hearing it now and again. And um, nobody argued about, you know, back in the 40s, 50s, and, well, that's not how you see it. They would laugh and they would joke about it and say their way that they speak it. And there was no support in the school system that they wanted to learn French and English, not Anishinaabe women. So I tell my fellow learners, don't be disheartened. Keep going, keep in there learning. And, and, and it's, um, it's a challenge. But it's our language, and we're not going to let it go. Um, and it's one of those spiritual things that you can love our language, even though you don't speak it. It's ours. Own it, keep it, and cherish it. And for that, I say thank you, for this and all the other things that we can learn, and for our people to be strong and hang in there. And be good to one another, love one another, and forgiving. Okay? Miwe, miigwech. Miigwech. And a very hearty uh, miigwech as well, Dr. Kishkatan. This was quite a, um, as our first session for the day, or for the year. Um, we're really thankful that you're able to find some time to spend with us today. And I would echo uh, David's comments. You know, sitting in your class, I know Vicky Maneg had uh, highly recommended you. And, uh, you know, certainly she had her class joining um, us today uh, where she was teaching at Georgian College. So I, I just want to thank you for sharing this time with us and certainly um, using the language, but also allowing us to, to learn a little bit and, and play with it as well. And um, so thank you to everybody who, who also spent time with us over the last hour and a half for this amazing uh, day. What a, what a beautiful time. And so I would like to also uh, invite you to our next uh, lecture. 
um, which will be on December 7th with Ruby Celia Huerta Norberto from the University of Guadalajara, Mexico. Um, so please check our events page for more information on this lecture. Um, and if you would like to go back and revisit today's lecture, it will be posted up on our website next week. Uh, you'll receive an email from Stacy once it's live, and then you can go back and, and spend some time uh, both in the chat uh, with the, with the uh, written form, but also just spending time um, engaging and listening as well. So to me, Dr. Kishkatan, and thank you everybody for joining us. Have a great day. <laughs>